We're honored today to have as our moderator Judge Jennifer Elrod. Judge Elrod has served as circuit judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit since being confirmed by a voice vote in 2007. Uh, there aren't many voice votes anymore. Prior to serving as a circuit judge, Judge Elrod was, Elrod was appointed and then twice elected judge of the 190th District Court of Harris County, Texas, where she spent more than five years presiding over more than 200 jury and non-jury trials. She's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Baylor University, where she was the outstanding graduating senior in the honors program and was later named an outstanding young alumna. She graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School, where she was an active member of the Harvard Federalist Society, an Ames Moot Court finalist, and senior editor of the Harvard Law Journal of Law and Public Policy. She clerked for the Honorable Sim Lake in the Southern District of Texas, and before serving as a judge, she was in private practice. You don't have to do that. Um, <laughs> all right, well, we're honored to have Judge Elrod as our moderator, and we'll let her introduce the members of the panel. Thank you. It is such a privilege to be here with you this morning on the last day of the Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention. Each year, without fail, the Federalist Society assembles a diverse array of accomplished lawyers and scholars who provide insights on pressing issues that confront our nation, the law, and the legal profession. Today's panel is no different. As a side note, you know that I really want to be here with you today, so much that I am missing ESPN game day at my alma mater, Baylor University, where the undefeated Baylor Bears 9-0 are taking on Oklahoma. Sick them. <laughs> As another side note, there may be an elephant in the room for some of you wondering what in the world is a federal judge doing moderating a Federalist Society panel? You may have seen some things in the newspaper about such things. Um, I want you to know that I take ethical responsibilities very seriously, and in fact, I am privileged to be an appointee on the Judicial Codes of Conduct Committee appointed by the Chief, the Chief Justice. So I have personally studied Advisory Opinions 116, and I can't speak for others, but I can speak for myself, and I believe it is entirely ethical to be engaged with lawyers and scholars leading in the fields in nonpartisan fashion in the wonderful way that the Federalist Society does. So I'm glad to be here. Our panel is called 51 Imperfect Solutions for the Ethical Practice of Law. I don't know if our friend Judge Jeff Sutton has approved of our riffing on his excellent book about state constitutions roles, but we are here to talk about the regulation by state authorities and how that makes this wonderful potpourri patchwork of ethical rules throughout our nation. The ethical practice of law in the United States is not monolithic. Each state establishes its own rules of professional conduct. This form of federalism allows states to serve as laboratories of democracy and innovate how the legal profession operates. The panel will focus on several areas. We will have a discussion about ABA Model Rule 8.4G. We'll discuss the wake of Janus and how states are discussing whether they should eliminate the integrated unitary bar. We will discuss novel experiments that, per, that permit non-lawyers to perform some types of legal services in order to keep the cost of legal services down and in order to expand the reach of legal services. And finally, we will discuss how legal analytics, including uh, are used to uh, predict how courts will decide cases and what are the ethical ramifications of that. 
Our distinguished panel includes Professor Thomas D. Morgan. Professor Morgan is an Oppenheim Professor of Antitrust and Trade Regulation Law Emeritus at George Washington University. He was Dean of the Emory University School of Law, and he's been on the faculties of the University of Illinois and in Brigham Young University. He is co-author of Problems and Materials on Professional Responsibility. Professor Morgan served as an associate reporter for both the ALI's Restatement of the Law, the, governing, the Law Governing Lawyers, and the ABA's Ethics 2000 Commission. He is an executive committee member of the Federalist Society's Professional Responsibility and Legal Education Practice Group, and a member of the ABA Business Law Section's Professional Responsibility Committee. His book, The Vanishing American Lawyer, was published by Oxford University Press. We also have here, you're over here, good. I was worried. I thought you were out in the hall with Josh selling books. No. <laughs> we have Mauricio Mo Hernandez, a business attorney in Goodyear, Arizona. Before moving to the Grand Canyon State, he was in general practice in northern Nevada and represented plaintiffs in state and federal courts. Prior to his career in law, he spent more than two decades working in petroleum marketing operations and management for a Fortune 50 multinational corporation. For the first five years, Mr. Hernandez, for the past five years, Mr. Hernandez has been vigorously engaged in legislative efforts to advance free speech and freedom of association interests of lawyers in Arizona. He has also continued fighting the foreseeable intensification of lawyer discipline resulting through new lawyer speech codes. He, and he has rallied opposition, opposition against similar re regulatory encroachments on auto attorney auto autonomy, individual judgment, and economic choice. In 2015, the Speaker of the Arizona House of Representatives appointed him to the House Ad Hoc Study Committee, Committee on Mandatory Bar Associations. And in 2016, he was the principal drafter of the House Concurrent Memorial, urging the state Supreme Court to modify its rules related to the state bar to ensure the protection of First Amendment freedoms. Welcome, Mr. Hernandez. <laughs> Our next speaker is the Honorable G. Barry Anderson. Justice Anderson is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School and a member of the, he, and he was a member of the Minnesota Court of Appeals until his appointment to the Supreme Court. He was sworn in and joined the court on October 13, 2004 and is currently the senior justice on that court. He previously was a partner in the Minneapolis and Hutchinson law firms of Arnold Alec Anderson and Dove and also served the city of Hutchinson as city attorney. He is a certified civil trial specialist, and he devotes considerable efforts in his time to public service uh, in, in various civic education. He also serves on the Minnesota Judicial Council, the managing body for the Minnesota Judicial Branch. We appreciate having you here, Justice Anderson. Thank you. And I guess I'll go ahead and introduce him but I think he's still in the hall. Professor Josh, Josh Blackman is known to many of you, and he is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law. He specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He is the author of several books, and his latest book, which, you, which is in the hall, and I'm not advocating people purchase books or not purchase books, but he is out in the hall with his book with Professor, uh, uh, that he has written with Professor Randy Barnett. Professor Blackman was selected by Forbes Magazine for 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy. He's testified in numerous hearings. He's the president of the Harlan Institute, the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS. You probably know him. And I understand as of last night, he got 2 million hits on his Twitter feed. Um, welcome to Professor Blackman. I know we'll welcome him when he gets here. But right now, we're going to get started. Professor Morgan, will you lead the way? Thank you, Judge Elrod. We have to admit that uh, 51 imperfect solutions for the practice of law 
may be a provocative title, but it may not strike everybody as a promising idea. Today, it seems almost countercultural. Law practice now is increasingly national and international in character, and an appealing argument is being made that the rules governing lawyer conduct ought to be uniform and not subject to multiple uh, jurisdictional distinctions. In this conference, uh, I suspect there, it's a lot easier to sell the idea of uh, uh, state-based uh, regulation of lawyers. This is the uh, method of regulation that would have been familiar to the founders. Uh, the regulation of lawyers has been for centuries under the control of courts, uh, and uh, uh, the, it has fallen to the advocates of uniformity to, uh, who are found primarily in national law firms and the American Bar Association uh, to draft model rules that then are submitted to the states uh, and hopefully, uh, at least in the minds of the drafters, will be adopted unchanged. Over the last 50 years or so, however, the model rule enterprise has not produced uniformity. First, many of the rules of legal ethics are a compromise of conflicting policy values. And it's reasonable to expect that state court justices around the country uh, will weigh the values differently. Second, model rules proposed by the ABA only get to be model rules by passing through an ABA legislative process that is not always uh, guaranteed to produce a high quality product. I've been involved in several of uh, the roles that make up the ABA process. And while I don't question the sincerity of the people that are uh, working in that uh, area, I can say that what gets through the ABA House of Delegates is usually the result of coalition building and compromise. Uh, proponents of a rule change tend to get prestige by passing something not by withdrawing uh, a bad idea. Uh, and uh, that does not necessarily lead to a coherent, uh, consistent set of professional standards. Thus, the ABA can wind up offering proposals that represent an effort at uniformity, but that may not necessarily be sound policy. This morning, I will use to illustrate this process briefly, uh, model Rule 8.4G, one that several of you I know have worked on, uh, others uh, may have heard about. Uh, it is now before several of the states and has received a lot of attention by our practice group, thanks especially to the work of our colleague Josh Blackman. Rule 8.4G would impose professional discipline on any lawyer who, quote, engages in conduct that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know is harassment or discrimination on the basis of race, sex, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, or socioeconomic status in conduct related to the practice of law. That rule has a lot to unpack, and I'm not going to go into all of it today. But most important for most of those of us who are critical of it is that Model Rule 8.4G appears to be just waiting to be employed uh, as an imposition uh, on a lawyer's freedom of speech. The concept of harassment might uh, 
uh, easily be used to try to punish someone for the expression of ideas that some other person in one of the protected groups uh, says they find hurtful or offensive or both. Now it's important to remember that lawyers do not have unlimited uh, 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 freedom of speech. Model Rule 8.4C prohibits a lawyer's conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. And I think we can all recognize those are inappropriate uh, uses of speech. And Judge Elrod and Justice Anderson are not constitutionally required to be indifferent about a lawyer's failure to behave with civility in the courtroom before them. Advocates of Rule 8.4G say that's analogous to what its prohibitions would do. The proposed rule addresses conduct that the lawyer knows constitutes harassment or discrimination. Who, the proponents say, could object to punishing speech that a lawyer knowingly weaponizes so as to intentionally hurt other people. I agree that that is a test proposition for the validity of uh, this rule, but I disagree with those who think that the uh, proposed rule handles the situation properly. First, while it may be uh, uh, hard to defend conduct that a no lawyer knows uh, amounts to discrimination or harassment, the ABA rule also reaches speech that the lawyer reasonably should know is harassing or discriminatory. The reasonably should know test is always addressed in hindsight. And a lawyer can never really know when people will determine that he or she did not actually know of the, uh, the effect but reasonably should have known the uh, effects of the lawyer's statements or acts. Second, an even greater problem with proposed model rule 8.4G is its failure to intelligibly define harassment and discrimination. You may think that we have lots of law defining both of those terms. But the ABA in Model Rule 8.4G has expressly refused to be bound by such precedent. After much negotiation, uh, which as I say is, is part of the ABA's process, probably part of any legislative process, uh, Comment 3, which uh, addresses this topic, says only that law relating to harassment and discrimination may guide application of paragraph G. But the intended implication is that lawyer discrimination and harassment need not be defined or constrained by law developed in cases involving non-lawyers. As state Supreme Courts have considered Model Rule 8.4G and the cases for and against it, it appears that only two, Vermont and Maine, have adopted it as written. And even Maine is not uh, uh, perfectly uh, uh, aligned. Many states have had anti-discrimination rules <coughs> for several years and have seen no reason to change. Others looked at the rule and expressly rejected it. What tends to uh, distinguish the ABA proposal from existing state rules uh, and from new rules adopted in response to consideration of Model Rule 8.4G is the focus of the state rules on clear definitions of both prohibited acts and settings in which they're prohibited. They do what uh, most of the rest of Rule 8.4 does. They say that a lawyer may be professionally disciplined in addition to any civil or criminal penalties for conduct that would, be, would violate the law 
if done by anybody who wasn't a lawyer. We can go into that later, uh, but that's the, that's the standard approach of, of uh, the rest of uh, the companion sections of 8.4G. Our panel today is going to look at several other situations in which jurisdictions are likely to disagree and in which we may wind up with non-uniform approaches to lawyer regulation. I'm not saying the ABA is acting with an evil intent or is always wrong, but I've tried to use Model Rule 8.4G to illustrate that I think we're going to do better sticking with what uh, we have uh, uh, come to understand as the appropriate way of regulating lawyers. And that's through 51 potentially imperfect but uh, solutions for the practice of law, but efforts of the state uh, Supreme Courts to come up with the most effective ways uh, to uh, impose that regulation. Thank you, Professor. We will now hear from Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. The legendary American philosopher, Yogi Berra, <laughs> once said, if the world was perfect, it wouldn't be. <laughs> Yogi's pronouncement must surely be animating lawyer regulators in their unending quest to find even more imperfect solutions for the ethical practice of law. <laughs> Our topics today highlight that search but they should also underline the tension between regulator authoritarianism and lawyers who prize freedom of choice and professional autonomy. For example, should lawyers continue surrendering their First Amendment rights for what those favoring such constraints call the privilege of practicing law? Should lawyers continue subsidizing speech they disagree with? Should earning a living as a lawyer be conditioned on joining a professional trade association? Should the interests of the public be more important than the interests of lawyers? Such questions are at the heart of the discussions that we will be looking at today and what some call innovation and others call more of the same. Moreover, these questions and others also mold the debate over proposed lawyer misconduct rule 8.4G and the latest push to abolish integrated bars in the aftermath of Janus v. Atsme. No one disputes there's an access to justice gap, that legal services are unaffordable for many people. But disagreements predictably arise when regulators tinker with the protected interests of lawyers and consumers and redefine what it means to practice law. Justice Kennedy quipped almost 30 years ago during oral argument in Keller versus State Bar of California, everybody knows that lawyers don't agree on very much. As states conjure up even more exemptions to unauthorized practice, such as allowing non-lawyers to co-own law firms, lawyer disagreements will predictably arise that even Justice Kennedy may not have anticipated. As for my own hobby horse, contrary to what mandatory bars choose to believe, Keller did not settle the problem of force funding of political and ideological speech that's inherent in the mandatory bar model. Indeed, the claims Eddie Keller and 20 other California bar members made against their bar are largely indistinguishable from the uh, claims being made in the latest wave of litigation uh, filed against mandatory bars in Louisiana, 
in Michigan, North Dakota, Oklahoma, two in Oregon, Texas, Washington, and two others in Wisconsin. History has shown how imprecisely Keller's guide rails keep mandatory bars from using dissenting members' dues to fund political and ideological activities unrelated to regulatory purposes. The court itself acknowledged that drawing a precise line between acceptable and unacceptable activities wasn't always easy. Last year, the Supreme Court overruled uh, Abood versus Detroit Board of Education in order to decide Janus v. Atsme. The court struck down on free speech grounds deductions paid to public sector unions by non-members without affirmative consent. It rejected Abood's germane versus non-germane standard used to distinguish when non-members compulsory agency fees could be constitutionally required for germane activities like collective bargaining and when a public sector union could not compel non-member funds to fund activities considered non-germane. The Keller court had used Abood to decide Eddie Keller's claim, a compelled speech claim, as in Abood, a bar association like a public sector union may not fund political activity with mandatory funds, but the bar could force lawyers to join and to fund germane activities, in the court's words, to regulate the legal profession and improve the quality of legal services. When Abood was overturned, lawyers opposed to mandatory association and compelled funding saw an opportunity to help cut off the rest of the footings under Keller. But in practice, the post-Keller years saw few mandatory bars undertaking any kind of rigorous germane versus non-germane analysis. Uh, as in Janus, where non-members were required to pay for undetermined lobbying that might eventually be beneficial to local bargaining unit members, the union's approach was so broad and vague, in the court's words, to encompass just about anything the union might choose to do. Mandatory bars have for decades relied upon the same vague approach to justify their uses of mandatory dues. But before the court decided Janice, Arnold Fleck, his filed a lawsuit against a North Dakota bar. It was working its way through the federal courts. Fleck sued in 2014 after discovering that the bar was using his dues to oppose a shared parenting measure that he supported. So he sued, claiming that mandatory membership violated his First Amendment right of association, his First Amendment right not to subsidize ideological speech he disagreed with, and his First Amendment right to affirmatively consent before subsidizing non-germane expenditures. The post-Janus Bar cases buttressed by the rejection of Abood are challenging the constitutionality of compelled compelling lawyers to join a state bar association. They also contest the presumption that lawyers, once forced to join, consent to subsidizing that association by requiring them to opt out if they disagree. Among the 10 cases, the alleged non-germane use of dues by the defendants range from opposing tort reform in Oklahoma to amending the definition of marriage in Texas, uh, in Oregon, both plaintiffs and both lawsuits cite the publication of a statement on white nationalism and normalization of violence in the Bars magazine. While in Wisconsin, they cite, or they take issue rather, with the Bars uh, expenditure of over $520,000 last session on lobbying. And in Texas, consistent with Janice, the plaintiffs seek affirmative consent procedures and germanist safeguards to prevent mandatory dues expenditures from being used for impermissible purposes unrelated to regulating lawyers or improving the quality of legal services. The plaintiffs also uniformly argue that Janice's exacting scrutiny standard of review applies to the mandatory membership requirement. When associational freedoms are infringed, the requirement is unconstitutional unless the state shows that its compelling interest cannot be achieved in a less restrictive way. 
Well, we know it can be done. The centuries-long history and op successful operation of 18 voluntary bar states demonstrate that states can indeed achieve their compelling interest regulating lawyers less restrictively. Now, the renewed litigation to regain lawyer free speech and freedom of association rights from compulsory bars offers a basis to frame these lawsuits as part of a wider assessment of how lawyers think about their own constitutional rights. As Professor Margaret Tarkington, I'm not getting paid for this, uh, <laughs> points out in her terrific book, Voice of Justice, Lawyers have long undervalued these rights, particularly their free speech, petition, and association rights. She posits that when lawyer First Amendment rights are reclaimed from regulators, lawyers will more fully realize their roles as voices of justice to check government and institutional power to protect client life, liberty, and property. Finally, Last month, I checked in with my friend, Michigan lawyer, Alan Falk. In the annals of mandatory bar litigation, Alan Falk is a familiar name. His first challenge was 42 years ago this month when he filed a petition alleging that the Michigan bar was using his mandatory dues to fund activities violating his First Amendment right of association, speech, and religion. Now, lawyers like Allen, uh, who want to reclaim their First Amendment rights, are often called quixotic, jousting unsuccessfully for years against an entrenched system. So on the news that the Eighth Circuit had again rejected Arnold Fleck's mandatory dues challenge, I was eager to get Allen's take on the ruling and about all the post-Janus litigation that has followed. After decades of enduring his own frustrations battling the Michigan bar, I asked Alan if his outlook had changed. Had he become cynical? Was he pessimistic about the eventual outcome of all this new litigation? He said he remained ever the optimist. I'm still that kid, he told me, who on Christmas morning is wide-eyed, digging with excitement through a huge pile of horse manure, convinced there must be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Justice Anderson. Thank you. Uh, two, um, two Minnesota specific points before we begin. Uh, first, uh, we heard earlier about somebody else's football team. I just want to note that the University of Minnesota Golden Golfers are um, eight and zero, uh, and and um, actually nine and zero now as a result of their victory over Penn State last Saturday. And just to show you what an accomplishment that is for a Minnesota football team, the last time the Gophers were um, nine and zero was 1904. <laughs> Some of us have been waiting a long time for that day. The second Minnesota-specific thing I should note, uh, uh, and I don't see our colleague uh, Josh Blackman here yet, but you know he he poked. You, know, you just made an interest. Well, he posts a this day in, in uh, Supreme Court history thing um, periodically. And today's note is um, on this date in 1939, United States Supreme Court Justice Pierce Butler died. He happens to be from uh, Minnesota, one of three Minnesota uh, Minnesotans who've served on the United States Supreme Court, and is also famous for um, as my colleague David Strauss pointed out to me many years ago, um, David is back in the room hiding there somewhere, uh, now a, a member of the, the um, uh, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Pierce Butler was famous for dissenting in the infamous Buck v. Bell decision. Uh, so two Minnesota notes before we begin. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about alternative legal practice as it is experienced in the states, and that means you have to first talk about the problem. So over the course of my remarks, I want to cover three areas. I want to talk about the extent of the problem, some of the responses that states have had to these concerns, and then finally talk about effectiveness of solutions and how to perhaps construct effective alternative legal practice programs. Let's talk first about the problem. It comes in two flavors. 
First, when we, when we talk about lack of access to justice, which drives a lot of these conversations, the media coverage is almost exclusively fo uh, focused upon um, areas where lawyers are not sufficiently um, present, uh, uh, not available to individuals who have problems. So let's, let's review some of those statistics. Nothing more interesting than listening to a speaker recite statistics, but we, we're going to do it because I think we have to do it to understand the problem. Let's start with a 2015 Utah Task Force report. Um, and you're going to see some consistency here in these statistics, which I think tells us something. In debt collection cases, something like 98% of respondents were self-represented were, were, uh, self um, in debt collection matters, in eviction housing matters, um, over eight, in the neighborhood of 8,000 cases. 96% of tenants were self-represented, uh, while 87% of landlords um, had counsel. Um, in family law matters, divorce, annulment, things of that sort, 80% of respondents in 13,000 cases, I mean, we're talking pretty significant pool of data here, were self-represented, and only 40% of petitioners had counsel. And that's, I think, a significant statistic because, um, you know, it's one thing for a party in a divorce uh, to not be represented, they're a respondent, maybe there's been an agreement, et cetera, but in the, in the state of Utah, in this sample, um, half of those seeking a divorce were not represented by counsel. Similar statistics apply elsewhere. I'm going to give you some, some numbers from Minnesota. Again, they're very consistent with the Utah experience. 96% of debtors, no representation um, um, in housing disputes. 51% of landlords had representation, um, but only 3% of tenants did not. Family law matters, 47% had representation. Only 16% of respondents had representation. Um, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find other statistics dealing with legal aid issues. Um, from a 2015 Minnesota study, 60% of those who were eligible for legal aid, in other words, they met the income standards, uh, contacted legal aid for help and were turned down because there were insufficient resources available to uh, provide um, legal assistance. Now, I, I, I want to offer a cautionary note about some of these statistics. Um, I don't mean to minimize the significance. They are very significant. But I think you have to be a little careful. Uh, I used to do some landlord-tenant work, both representing landlords and tenants. Uh, I had a general law practice, which meant that um, if I wasn't an expert in the problem when you walked in the door, I was an expert by the time you walked out. Um, <clears throat> and, and so uh, I, would, I would see both landlord and tenants uh, to deal with these issues. If you've got a rent dispute, and there's no dispute that the rent wasn't paid, um, uh, it may not be so surprising that you have single digit legal representation. But I think it's fair to say that landlord-tenant disputes are not 95 or 96 percent in favor of the landlord. I think we can say that there are some problems here. But I want to talk about a, a, a little different angle, sort of a second subset to the access, access to justice problem that I noticed from my own personal experience. Um, it's not just a function of um, in, inability to retain a lawyer because of the, um, because of the cost of uh, lawyers. It's also a function of is, are there lawyers available? So just a piece of personal history. I began my practice of law in 1979 uh, with a pretty good-sized law firm in Fairmont, Minnesota, a community of about 11,000 people immediately north of the Iowa border. Um, Gophers are playing Iowa this afternoon, and I anticipate that they'll win. Um, just That's just an aside. Um, but the... Um, it, it, I, I re the court recently had the opportunity to go back to Fairmont uh, and um, hold oral argument there before in the local high school. There's about half the, the number of lawyers practicing in that community today than practiced there in 1979. Um, a town in the area that had um, uh, a very large, for, the, for rural Minnesota law firm, um, that particular county now has one lawyer practicing in it. Uh, we had one, we have several counties in Minnesota where there are single digit lawyers um, practicing. We had one county 
um, where it was necessary to import a lawyer to serve as the county attorney. In Nebraska, there are seven counties with no lawyers. I was talking to a member um, of um, uh, the North Dakota Supreme Court, and he indicated they have similar issues. So it's not just a function, when we talk about access to justice issues, it's not just a function of um, inability to pay for a lawyer. In some cases, we're having trouble putting lawyers in communities where they can help people. So how do we deal with that problem? Uh, so that leads me to the second point, which is what have states done in turning to trying to resolve these issues? Uh, it's a complicated and difficult problem for reasons I'll talk about in a moment, but, I, but let's, let's consider some of the examples. I just want to mention in passing Minnesota. I'm not going to talk a lot about it because eventually the task force that we've created is going to produce a report and I'm going to be expected to vote on it. And I just as soon not have the videotape here marked as Exhibit A and have a discussion about what I said about that, about that task force. I'll just say that it's ably chaired by uh, my colleague Paul Thiessen, a uh, member of the Minnesota Supreme Court, and my colleague John Rodenberg, a judge of the uh, Minnesota Court of Appeals and a former district court judge. And we have a pilot project that's underway, and we're hoping that we'll see some um, proposals from, from, that op from that opportunity. Um, let's start with... Um, uh, some examples. Uh, they fall into kind of two different kinds of categories, form preparation and uh, empowering legal assistance to um, sometimes appear in court or to advise clients. Often these examples will say, uh, courts will say that you can't provide legal, you, you can't provide legal advice, but you can assist in preparing forms. And how you draw that line is a little difficult for me to understand, which is sometimes in filling out the form, aren't you providing legal advice? Um, so there's, there's a little lack of um, clarity in where that's going to, going to occur. But let's talk about some of these examples. New York court has, the New York courts have a system that they call navigators aimed at pro se litigants, you have to have three hours of training, they work largely in non-payment of rent proceedings or consumer debt uh, efforts, um, they are allowed in court and authorized to answer fact questions, but they're to provide legal information and not advice. Um, as I said, drawing that line may prove challenging. Um, Colorado has a system it calls the Sherlock's system, um, again, providing legal information, not advice, and working on assisting in forms. Arizona has a very robust model, and we have an expert, I'm gonna call him an expert down here uh, because he happens to practice in Arizona. So if you ask me any technical questions about that, I'm just gonna look right over there and we'll have uh, Mr. Hernandez answer the question. But what's interesting about it is it's a certified legal document preparer program, um, and um, candidly, um, those who go through the program, acquire the necessary training, um, are empowered to help in filling out almost any kind of legal form. At least that's the way I read the rule. And um, I think it's pretty robust. Uh, it's something, a model I think that others uh, may want to consider. Um, another model that we have uh, that has become uh, the subject of a great deal of discussion, I'm good, but I'm gonna have a caveat to that in a minute, uh, is, the, is the Washington model, which deals with limited license uh, um, technicians. In other words, licensing legal assistants or paralegals um, in um, primarily family law areas now and perhaps uh, extended to, to um, debt collection issues and consumer uh, finan finance issues. Um, uh, the um, the limitations, there are some significant limitations on, on what uh, these legal assistants can do, but um, uh, they are uh, they are empowered to help um, persons who fall within the category of the uh, program. Now you could talk at great length about each of these programs, but and I cite them only as examples. But I want to talk about them in the context of the third point that I want to visit with you today about, which is: Are these programs effective, and what makes for an effective alternative legal practitioner program or alternative legal practice program? Um, I would suggest the available data that we have is that nobody has uh, an answer that fits every possible solution or every possible problem. Um, and and I, it suggests what my colleague Professor Morgan here suggested, which is that we really should be encouraging states to experiment 
um, because I suspect there's a better answer in each of these than each of these alternatives that I've discussed today. What do, why do I say that? Well, for example, the Washington model, which has sparked a great deal of interest, uh, the American Bar Association has uh, recommended it as something that states should be considering. Um, that model um, has, uh, I think they're, they're less than 50 licensed technicians, and that program's been around since two, 2014. The Arizona model has been around since 2003, and they have about 800 um, um, document, certified document preparers in a state um, of 7 million people. Minnesota model just getting going, I mean, and so, forth, and so and so on in terms of actual participation. Why is that? Bunch of reasons. Um, time doesn't, doesn't permit me to go into them, but remember I talked earlier about the issues relating to the availability of lawyers. Some of this relates to the continued profitability of the rural practice of law, and those factors are also present in um, the context of, for example, empowering uh, paralegals uh, to represent individuals. It's a very complicated problem. How do we go about making, that, making sure that these programs are effective? We're going to have to involve the lawyers who are directly affected. We're going to have to provide for task forces that are more than just folks who think we need to impose solutions on lawyers who are actually practicing in these areas. And we're going to have to uh, experiment. And some experiments are going to fail. Um, that is also part of what it means uh, to have a federalism model and to have uh, experiences that cover 50 states. Now, I could go on a greater length here, but I'm going to be ruled out of order by my colleague on the federal bench, so I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Justice Anderson. That's a very gracious response to the red light. <laughs> now, I'm familiar with the red light problem, yes. I'm here. Now, Professor Blackman, so nice of you to join us today. Good, I thing, I, good thing that you're not in court. No, I know. I'd be in contempt right now. Legal ethics panel, huh? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I apologize. Fetsock double booked me. You can't double bill. You shouldn't double book. Uh, we're having a book signing. They're sold out, so you can't get any more, but I signed everyone. Thank you so much. My apologies to Judge Elrod, Justice Anderson, Tom Morgan, and Mo. Uh, my topic today is about legal analytics, which is something of a cutting edge topic that we now need to bring to the Fetsock audience. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about my experience with legal analytics. Second, I want to talk about law firms are developing this marketplace. And third, like any good FedSoc talk, I like to talk about how the government has and will try to regulate this technology to either stifle it or protect consumers, depending which perspective you come from. Uh, how did I get in this field? Um, Ten years ago today, or actually this week, I created Fantasy SCOTUS. Yes, when I was a maybe four months out of law school, I built a Supreme Court Fantasy League. I did. I had this crazy idea of what if we had people putting down numbers of how they think each of the justices would rule in a given case. It was mostly a joke, but then I decided to actually build it. And within about 24 hours, it went viral. I launched it at the convention in 2009, so just about a decade ago this week. Uh, over the past decade, we've had thousands and thousands of people make predictions on how the Supreme Court will decide cases. Um, but this database I had gave rise to an idea. What if we pool the wisdom of the crowds? Right, what is the wisdom of the crowds? If I ask one of you, what is the temperature in this room? Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. But if I ask every one of you what is the temperature and I average those out, I will put money that's the right answer, or at least close enough. The concept is when you ask a lot of people with different experiences and different backgrounds, about an idea, they bring different ideas to bear. Intellectual diversity, one might call it. This is a concept of the wisdom of the crowds. And let me tell you something. Our players in Fancy Scotus are really good. We get an average 70, 75% of the cases right. Our top players get 80% right. I will put them against any partner in a law firm and they will beat them. I, I, I put that money down. But I didn't stop at just crowds. A couple years later, I partnered with two professors who are also computer scientists, and we began to develop an algorithm to predict the outcome of Supreme Court cases. We were able to reduce every single appeal down to about 80 variables, which we coded, and our algorithm was not as good as the people. 
The people, the machine has not risen yet. The, the, the people still prevailed, but our algorithm was at 70 odd percent, which beats random. But you don't stop there, right? The, the key, the, 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 the crowding moment is when you combine man and machine. Right? When you have the algorithms predicting some cases and people predicting others. For example, most people don't know enough about ERISA or bankruptcy to make informed predictions. But those are actually fairly easy to predict. But when you have a case say, involving abortion or guns or substantive due process, people tend to be better at those. So you figure out where are machines better and where are people better. And that is what we're looking for in this industry. Right? This is not some sort of magic button where you click beep beep Siri to you know, try a case for me. Right? That's not going to happen. Right? It's how do you leverage this technology to improve the practice of law and hopefully access to justice, which is what we're all trying to do, give justice for all. Um, in fact, I was briefly, for a couple of years, uh, in one of these legal tech companies. I, as I exited, uh, I'm no longer one of them, but I saw firsthand how this technology develops. All right. Second, I want to walk through some of the areas where we're using this technology. Who here has used e-discovery? Almost all of you, right? Any of you use machine learning to, instead of keyword searches? Okay. The prospect of discovery is looking at a huge trunk of documents, and usually just searching for a keyword, like privilege or something like that. But as we all know, those keyword searches are not always very effective. In fact, often you will miss stuff and inadvertently turn over privileged documents to opposing counsel, and that creates a headache all to itself. Um, machine learning is different. Rather than just doing dumb searches for words, it figures out from context what might be a privileged communication. Right, you may not realize this, but this is actually fairly sophisticated technology that's deciding what is and is not privileged. What are some other examples? I think Justice Anderson mentioned landlord-tenant law. This is a very important area where people have fairly mundane disputes can use apps, tools on their phone. If there's a broken you know, heating valve in their apartment or a sink is backed up, right? Instead of having to go hire a lawyer, you can maybe file some sort of complaint in an app with the, with the, with the county housing board, right? But now we get a little more sophisticated. Contract drafting, right? This is something which lawyers take very personally, but what most lawyers do is they have boilerplate and they sort of move stuff around. You can have a person who's not sophisticated who enters certain terms into a form, and that form spits out a contract that's pretty darn good. The same way you have TurboTax right, or, 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 or Quicken that can ask you questions to generate a 1040, a tax return, the building blocks for a contract operate in a similar fashion. Okay, That maybe sounds intimidating, but I'm not done yet. What if we have analytics about judges? Oh, Judge Elrod's nodding at me. What if I could tell you that this judge grants motions to dismiss in these sort of cases 80% of the time? Or if I could tell you this form in Delaware, right, routinely dismisses for lack of jurisdiction, of personal jurisdiction, right? What if I were to tell you that these judges routinely grant oral argument and these let stuff go to trial because they don't want to decide motions? Now, these are the kind of things lawyers kind of know anecdotally. Right? They build up experience from years of practice. Maybe their, their firm has a binder on every judge. I know you have these things, right? A binder, I know, I know. You have a binder on every judge, and the partner has the coveted bookshelf, right? So, oh, you have Judge X. So let me tell you about Judge X. But this is all anecdotal stuff. You can study this stuff. You can train it. And there are tools that exist today that let you see with a degree of accuracy how judges might handle certain motions. And this is very useful for you if you want to decide, do you try a case? Do you settle? Let it go to a jury, right? These are not just sort of, well, ask a partner with gray hair what he thinks. There are, no, no offense people with gray hair, I'm sorry. I have some myself now, they're coming in. Um, but there are tools you can use to actually inform this with some precision. All right. Now, what does regulation look like in this sphere? So far, uh, very almost non-existent. Uh, there are companies like LegalZoom. Uh, LegalZoom will maybe produce a will for you, or an incorporation of a, uh, they'll incorporate a company for you, or these sort of I don't say mundane, but fairly simple tasks. And some states have tried to shut them down, saying they're engaged in UPL, our favorite, right? The unauthorized practice of law. This is a term that's not defined anywhere. I think there are due process vagueness challenges. I'm on the wrong panel for that. But this is an important term, because if you are a tech company, not a law firm, but a tech company, you have some problems. <laughs> OK, now we want to talk about four areas of resistance. So I'm talking, no, I'm talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Rage Against the Machine. No, no, no. Resistance to this technology. 
Uh, the first is state bars. Uh, I don't think they've quite caught on to this, but they will soon enough. Uh, I think we'll see some of these legal tech companies face UPL suits. Uh, they're not owned by attorneys. These firms are not even run by attorneys often. They're run by tech people from Silicon Valley. Um, I think we will see UPL suits. Uh, once the bar realizes that there's competition to be had, uh, cartels do what cartels do. They, they rent seek and they shut things down. Um, the second area I can see a form of resistance is resistance from judges, but I will not say judicial resistance. That word's been used way too much this weekend. Um, I don't know, and I'll ask my two judges in the panel, my, my, my dear friends, how judges react to these sort of algorithms, right? If people are putting out reports saying, here's how Judge X is going to rule, that's got to feel kind of weird, because that means, am I really individual? Am I autonomous, right? Am I that predictable? Will a judge decide just do the opposite of where the algorithm says, says you know, forget it, I'm going to do the opposite, right? It, it's, it's a bit of a, if there are any judges in the room, I encourage you to maybe talk to me afterwards. It's a disconcerting feeling when they say there's an 80% chance you will do X. It's just a little bit weird. You know, what if judges decide, okay, I'm going to decide cases. You know, Justice Kennedy, if you're in the court, let me check fancy SCOTUS. How should I vote in this case? What do the people want? Tell me, right? It, you know, instead of checking what he has for breakfast, check my prediction market. It's a little bit of weirdness. And then that leads to an even weirder function. What if judges just start doing what the algorithm says? That can create an ossification, a, a fixture of the law where things are basically stuck in place. All right. Um, the next area where I think we'll have some resistance from law firms themselves. Uh, currently, a lot of these tech companies are sort of operating in the shadows. They're being hired as contractors. Uh, but I think law firms might become annoying. Saying, Wait a minute. Why are we paying these whiz kids when we know the best? Right? We know what the courts are going to say. Um, but uh, eventually, either the law firms will buy these companies or they'll try and shut them down. Either one. I don't know which one, but there'll be resistance. My final point with about 30 seconds left are clients. Right? We have to always think about clients first. Right? Can you artificially program Atticus Finch, right? the great lawyer? Can you put in ethos, or Lord help me, empathy? Right? Can you code empathy, which you want to, to a judge? I don't know. Uh, but here's where the title of our topic comes to play. It's 51 Imperfect Solutions. Um, we have laboratories of democracy. We do not have a single nationwide code of law, thankfully. States can do what they want to do. And in some states, you see experimentation. California, for example, is considering whether these tech companies can be owned by non-lawyers. I mean, it seems like a mundane issue, but it's very important. I don't know where this technology leads, but I think all of us should think about it as we go back to our state bars, see how can we perhaps welcome this technology, but ensuring always that clients do come first. And I apologize again for being late. Thank you so much. Wow. That's so much, we don't know where to go. You know, we could ask the panel to decide if, if Professor Blackman has violated model rule 8.4G oh by talking about people's gray hair. Oh boy, um, age, oh boy, could, oh know, boy, we could, sanction uh, me. <laughs> you know, we could instead talk about how judges are also using predictive data analytics uh, as tools and sentencing pilot programs and things. We could talk about, uh, with our antitrust experts, what do we think that who's going to who's going to um, put the protest against all these newfangled ways of making our services more ubiquitous and cheaper, uh, and and are lawyers going to revolt? Um, we and or we could talk about. Um, what, what's keeping these practical tools that you've talked about, Your Honor, from, uh, from being more, more widely distributed and what, what your ideas would be for that? So it's, it's free time, and uh, we're going uh, to let Mo go first if he wants to go uh, and talk about whatever he wants to talk about in that genre. That's a lot of things to talk about. And you can begin lining up as well because we're going to take questions. I think that's one of the most valuable parts of what these conferences. I have a question about the legal analytics component uh, with respect to access to justice. Uh, I understand how it can help in cl complex litigation, but how will that tool help uh, uh, consumers with kitchen table issues having to do with um, an eviction uh, proceeding, uh, somebody getting cheated at work with overtime that they're not getting paid, uh, things like that. How, how does that help? Yeah, th thanks, Mo. 
See, I'm a bit of an apostate. I actually am skeptical of the technology that I build, you know, sort of almost like a, a Luddite in my own world. Um, I don't know how much this helps the little guy. And, and the reason why is that these are tools that are going to be designed for fairly sophisticated parties. I think that's where they're most uh, helpful. In fact, they may actually screw the little guy. Uh, Judge Elrod mentioned uh, uh, sentencing guidelines, right? Any judges who do sentencing here know that sentencing is a very human judgment. Uh, perhaps no more human judgment there is than putting a person in prison. And when you have an algorithm that says, ah, given these factors and these offenses, here's a number, th that, that bothers me a little bit. Now, maybe if you have a really tough judge and the algorithm's lower, but keep in mind, the person coding this is a human being who has his own biases, who violates 8.4G on a daily basis, I'm sure, right? But I mean, if I want to be a libertarian, I can code a presumption of a liberty into my algorithm. Will anyone ever know? It's a black box. So don't always trust the code. I, I am, again, I'm, I'm an apostate in my own field, but I'm skeptical of what I'm doing. Justice? So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hernandez, you and I had a conversation before we began today, and we were talking a little bit about the Arizona experiment, and we talked about the importance of stakeholders. And I'm wondering if you could share with our audience a little bit of what you told me and why, why you think that's important. Well, thank you very much, Judge, for asking that question, because that, that's been one of my concerns. Uh, according to the ABA, uh, out of the 1.2 million lawyers that are practicing in the United States, 46% or well over half a million of them are sole practitioners and uh, lawyers in small two to five member law firms. And so a lot of the uh, initiatives uh, to promote access to justice will have great implications on that segment of the lawyer population. And my concern, particularly in Arizona, where they had a 15 member task force uh, studying this, um, there were, I think one uh, small firm was represented on the task force and there were no sole practitioners on it. Half the membership were uh, judges or people in judicial administration. Uh, there were two uh, law school professors uh, engaged and two big law firms, uh, ex-bar presidents, uh, were, were there. And uh, so at the end of the process, surprise, surprise, uh, a lot of the recommendations that were issued on October 4th uh, have broad implications. Uh, one uh, will modify Ethical Rule 5.4 which will allow uh, non-lawyer ownership of uh, law firms. And, uh, and the other one will uh, sort of what I say, take the existing certified legal document preparer that's been around for 16 years and sort of put it on steroids because uh, the folks uh, in that program and then getting into the other one, uh, the legal, limited legal license technician program will be focused on family law. Uh, which is the bread and butter of a lot of those, that segment. And so uh, it's, it's kind of unique. The Utah model and the Minnesota model uh, have uh, paralegals or li limited licensed practitioners that will be under the supervision of an attorney. But uh, the Arizona model is more along the lines of what Washington has done, where uh, they can go to court without supervision of an attorney. Uh, granted, they will have training ahead of time, but it sort of uh, puts into question, in my mind, the proposition of whether or not uh, what's the purpose of law school if uh, you're going to have uh, non-lawyers practicing in the, in the courts. And my biggest criticism, of course, is that there's a lack of stakeholders uh, on these task force, uh, being that segment of 46% of lawyers, and and there should be law students uh, involved because you have law students matriculated in these law schools paying substantial sums for their education, and when they graduate, the value proposition, or as I said when I was in business, a return on investment, um, is, is sort of put into doubt. Uh, because now the, the field has changed and they had no chance to weigh in on those uh, changes. So there's a reliance interest that's going to be implicated as well. One more quick question. Have you seen uh, bar organizations, bar, the bars in the states, have any of them retracted some of their, their services down to the core bread and butter functions in order to try to ward off these complaints that people have been raising? Yeah, yes, it seems to me that one of the things that we are seeing is that the concept of the integrated bar 
is yeah. changing in some areas. Uh, Nebraska is one that I, I recall just fairly recently where you break up the um, oh, the section function and a whole variety of the socializing function uh, into a voluntary bar and uh, <clears throat> retain uh, the discipline function, perhaps the lawyer, uh, the client security fund, uh, these things in a, uh, an official bar. The integrated bar historically came out of the idea of the ends of court, where the judges came out of the bar the bar and the court were seen as together. That's where a long way from uh, old England, but uh, uh, there will, I think this is an area where we really will see considerable variety and the pressures that Mo was talking about are uh, certainly going to affect how that, that turns out. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first question. One clarification from Mr. Hernandez. I was wondering if you could explain to the audience the different types of bars and how that affects your analysis. For instance, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the bar is an agency of the state Supreme Court. In other places, it's a private entity. And in terms of this free speech analysis that you were speaking of, how does that impact it? And then secondly, to the, the panel as a whole, for the majority of this country's history, the profession did not attend bar law schools. Not until well after the Civil War did law schools become the norm. So if we're talking about access to justice, is there any good reason that we can't find the next Abraham Lincoln and just let somebody study under another lawyer and then go out into the profession after he passes some certification exam? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll comment on that second part before I answer the first. Uh, uh, California still allows uh, 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 people to uh, read the law. Isn't and Kim then, Kardashian doing that? Yes. <laughs> and she uses Randy Barnett's contracts casebook, by the way. <laughs> she Instagrammed it. And, and Oregon just allowed the same thing. Oregon just passed a recommendation to permit the same thing to read the, the law. So, uh, of course, uh, that, that will have implications for the, the law schools uh, as an institution. And, and, and I suggest maybe this whole thing needs to be re-engineered in certain ways, not just uh, picking at the at the margins of reform. Um, but with respect to the mandatory bars uh, and the unified bars are, are, and, and the voluntary bars, I mean, there's a lot of euphemisms that go in there that I sort of find objectionable. One is the unified bar uh, and, and the integrated bar. Uh, they really are what they are. They're compulsory membership. In other words, they condition uh, your right to earn a living in that state on joining, being forced to join uh, a trade association that wears two hats. It's uh, got a regulatory hat uh, to enforce lawyer discipline, protect the public, and in Arizona it's got a, a trade function hat where they have their conventions and uh, various programs and the free legal research and the like, and uh, you can network and, uh, and, and sort of help your, your practices uh, that way. Um, there's 18 voluntary bar states. Virginia is not one of them. Uh, the voluntary bars, in fact, I had a conversation with three different lawyers yesterday, and, and because they practice in, uni in, in voluntary bar states, they didn't understand the, the whole problem, what the issue was, so, so I was happy to, to talk to them about it. Uh, I'm very passionate about it, as you can tell, uh, but uh, essentially, we want to promote the eradication of the abolishment of those 30 states where there, there is a, uh, a mandatory bar requirement, uh, whether you take a right to work uh, analysis to it, or whether you take as the Janus case to show us the way uh, that the standard now is heightened because when you're talking about First Amendment rights, um, an exacting scrutiny requires that the, the compelling state interest is the burdens on the state to show that it cannot achieve uh, its compelling interest for regulating lawyers in, in, in a less restrictive way. But the fact, the elephant in the room is that you have states like Colorado, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Connecticut, I mean, the 18 mandatory bars, Minnesota, uh, where the judge is from, there's a voluntary bar state. Um, they've been regulating lawyers. Lawyers there are as ethical as they are in mandatory bars. Uh, they they operate with the same oath. Uh, uh, they, nobody has ever said that uh, uh, the lawyers are less ethical in a voluntary bar state than in a mandatory bar. So, so there's really no need for it, 
And in Nebraska, as a judge said, uh, they, they, uh, they did recently uh, bifurcate the bar in 2013, and then California just did so last year as well. So they divided regulatory, non-regulatory functions uh, for that. So sorry for my long answer, but uh, I love talking helpful, about it. very helpful, educational. My question's for Justice Anderson. So many of the problems I heard you describe about the supply of lawyers in rural areas struck me as similar to the medical profession, where there's a lack of doctors, and the medical profession has also looked at nurse practitioners and non-doctors providing what used to be doctor services. In the work that's being done to look at options, do you see that there's been comparisons made to what the medical profession is doing, and are things that lawyers can look at to what this other regulated, also high cost of entry, high schooling, or profession offers? You know, I think that's a great question. And it's this question of, of um, how do you provide legal resources in particularly rural areas um, is one that is, is going to be very difficult to solve. And I want to I identify a couple of barriers here that tie back to your question. One is the changing nature of the legal practice. And I'm not making any value judgments here. Marketplaces make decisions sort of collectively and they have effects. When I started practicing in 1979, um, a significant part of revenue for any rural practitioner, uh, at least in Minnesota, um, this wasn't true elsewhere in the country, but at least in Minnesota was the preparation of title opinions. That has now become uh, almost, I wouldn't say almost exclusively, but largely a function of title insurance. Um, similarly, there's been a um, concentration of uh, personal injury work, which again has affected rural practitioners. And so one of the barriers here is well, there's a lot of theory about how are we going to get more lawyers to practice in places that don't have enough lawyers. The question is, is there enough revenue, is there enough business to sustain even um, a limited licensed technician who has some limited rights to appear in court? And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be something that we're going to be struggling with. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I want to correct one thing I said. I said there were seven counties in Nebraska that didn't have lawyers. According to the information I have, it's actually 11. I mean, it's, the, the, and the problem, I think, is going to get worse. Um, some, one of the models, candidly, that uh, the medical profession has adopted, you'll find rural communities that wind up subsidizing um, the hiring of doctors or uh, nurse practitioners or whatever to, to work in those communities. Now, I think the day when the local county board is going to subsidize lawyers is not, it, I, I don't think that's coming, but, but you know, I, I, th these are some, going to be some very complicated and difficult issues. Thank you. Oh, you want to weigh in? Can I weigh in on this? Uh, I think uh, Justice Anderson has hit the nail on the head. Part of the problem here is that there is a cost to practicing law or delivering legal services more generally. And the challenge is to figure out how we, we reduce that cost or um, otherwise lower the cost of resolving a dispute or achieving a result that somebody wants to get. And this is where some of the technology that Josh is talking about is likely to really play a part. There are uh, programs now, I understand, that are capable of taking in information about your case, not the big Supreme Court case, uh, taking the arguments on both sides and suggesting a result without any human being involved in the process uh, at all. I'm not advocating for that, but I'm saying that we're talking about a world in which uh, we can perhaps lower the transaction costs associated with uh, the delivery of legal services. It's a fascinating reality today that there are a number of the, the, at least the surveys I've seen, are that many solo practitioners are uh, working approximately two billable hours a day, maybe three. Uh, it isn't that they aren't in the office, they're trying to you know, keep busy or whatever, but uh, why aren't they going out to the rural communities? The fact is that it's costly. It's costly to, to do almost, to provide almost any solution. 
And the challenge for us is to either simplify procedures or otherwise uh, find ways to uh, get the uh, uh, get that transaction cost down. And it's it's not easy. But this is where these these institutions, uh, these these uh, uh, groups that are being set up by the states are so important. We're talking about California, Illinois, Virginia, uh, in addition to the ones we've talked about. Uh, these are big states. They're, the results are going to be watched. And I think we may well, uh, we're certainly going to see something better than just giving it to an ABA commission and saying, you solve it for everybody and, and uh, uh, then we'll work from there. That reminds me um, that when we've had a na natural disasters like Hurricane Harvey in Houston, the Supreme Court suspended the barriers to entry from out of state lawyers yeah. so that they could come in. And if you can do it in short term emergency situations, perhaps you can do it and suspend barriers to entry uh, as well. And that's just a thought. It's not a I'm not advocating that. Uh, um, so you have a question? I do. I, I have two, actually. First, on 8.4G, though more states have rejected it than have adopted it, um, the ABA still accredits law schools. And I wonder whether the panelists have seen any uh, noise or activity indicating that that accreditation power is going to be used to enforce the teaching of a model rule that has actually hasn't been uh, adopted very often. And then the second question that I'll sit down is more generally, it seems to me that each of your topics panelists call into question the core, the core issue of what is lawyering today? I've always thought of it as helping people manage the complexity of power or money sharing rules, but but I wonder whether the definition of it is something you could comment on since it seems to, you know, sort of be a common thread through all these issues. And I thank you. Thank you. I think the short answer to your question is that uh, uh, the to the extent that we're talking about the, the regulation that uh, law schools provide instruction in professional responsibility, including the model rules, uh, 8.4G is a model rule. Uh, and uh, so it's part of the requirement, and it's part of the MPRE. Uh, to get uh, to pass the MPRE, you've got to pass a test on the model rules, and not every uh, exam has an 8.4G question, but it is testable. Also, uh, it's, uh, it has its, <laughs> its, uh, its impact, even if it's not been adopted by the state. There are a number of rules that have not gotten a whole lot of purchase uh, in the states, uh, the sale of law firms uh, uh, rule, uh, the, uh, well, I won't go into all of them, but the, the point is they're all testable. May, may I add a point to Tom's um, observation? Is teaching a class at an ABA accredited law school conduct related to the practice of law? Um, sure. Would a professor, even an adjunct, in one of these states that adopts it, have to worry about a student filing a complaint with the bar if they make a statement in class that's demeaning on the basis of age, like my gray hair comment, perhaps. Mm -hmm. This is a non-trivial concern with this capacious definition of conduct related to the practice of law. Even adjuncts, rather than having a complaint to the dean, you get a complaint to the bar council. And, and don't think students have motivations. They may. They may want to come after you. So this is another reason why this rule is very, very scary for me. I'm tenured. I don't care. right? They can't take my tenure away from me, but they can yank my law license. right? That's still a pressure point that exists. Texas has not adopted. Thank you. But One of the questions I have regarding 8.4G particular that I don't see addressed often is the issue with attorneys who are um, have multi-jurisdictions. So for example, there's a possibility that if you're admitted in a jurisdiction that has adopted the model rule and one that is not, you could have a perfectly legal and, and ethical um, representation of a client or statement that then triggers in the adopted one, um, then re creating the opportunity for a reference back to the bar where you had a perfectly ethical practice. Um, I haven't seen a lot of uh, literature or discussion on that. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts of how we address this for attorneys who are admitted in, in multiple jurisdictions. Well, it's a problem that exists uh, in, in a number of areas where there is uh, 
uh, difference among the rules. And it's one of the reasons, it's one of the real arguments made by the advocates of uniformity for eliminating and just saying, let's get rid of the conflict of laws problem by uh, making the rule the same everywhere. And that's an appealing argument for people who, who are traveling all over the country uh, uh, in their practice. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, we do have conflicts of law rules in the model rules that uh, are designed to try to at least uh, minimize the likelihood that you're going to be um, convicted in a state that didn't make your act improper because, or just because, it was improper in, in some other state. Hi, first I'd like to thank Mo for suggesting that we law students have an interest in contributing. I'd like to not be in debt forever. <laughs> also, I'd like um, to direct a speculative question at the two professors on the panel. Um, they're mentioning by Judge Blackman about law firms maybe will buy some of these technology companies and also suggestion that non-lawyers may be able to own invest in some of these law firms with changing of law. How do you think these two changes, um, well, what are the main problems you think that these could create? For example, antitrust issues, um, ethical concerns, um, would it change the law practice in general? I mean, this is looking 10, 20, 30 years out as these things become more, um, it's more states adopt this. Do you, have a, do you have a comment, Professor Morgan? Could you, I, could you I hear have the a, question? It's really I hard think, in this I room think, to I hear think, the questions. I think I, heard, I think I heard, I, I think I heard most of the question. I think the question was, um, if law firms start acquiring uh, these legal tech companies, or, or conversely, you have these uh, legal tech companies starting to invest in law firms, what are the implications? Professor Morgan's well qualified to answer that question. That's exactly the question. Thank but you. What yeah. about also uh, large accounting firms? Yeah, big four. Big four. Yeah, I mean, what if what, KPMG? Do you have a comment on that? Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Morgan, I think you go, go first in this one. It is a regulated area, so it, I suspect that what's going to happen is that the, the uh, uh, state Supreme Courts will be invited to, to regulate uh, this area and try to minimize the antitrust issues, but uh, the, uh, there, there certainly could be an antitrust issue raised by the, uh, um, if you could, if somehow you've got a patented uh, technology that uh, uh, a single law firm can use to drive others out of business. And, uh, but this is, I think, I don't think this is where most of the practical issues are going to arise. There is so much development in the technology space that I think you'd be foolish to, to try to control the market by, by buying uh, companies uh, uh, that happen to have existing technology. Somebody else will invent around you uh, very shortly. And, uh, and so I suspect that this is not, not where the practical action is going to take place in this yeah. area. Yeah, uh, the, uh, Judge Elrod mentioned the accounting firms, the big four like KPMG and the others. They've entered the consulting space and they come close to legal practice in some areas. I think uh, Arizona, did you read that right, Mo? I think Arizona is looking at yeah. maybe breaking out of barriers. Because once, yeah, oh, they did it? Yeah. Oh, well, they did it. Thanks, Mo. I'm going to go out for public comment. <laughs> he, uh, Mo knows. Um, Remember Bono's? Bo yeah. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Mo knows. Um, not Monet, Mo knows. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut up now. But I think, I think that there's a, there's a space for the accounting firms perhaps to crowd in. And you may see some consolidation, which could give rise to antitrust concerns, which I think the question was about a moment ago. Judge, could I just uh, suggest there are three major areas that these uh, commissions in the various states are looking at, and at least uh, it's, it's useful to kind of keep them straight. One is authorizing non-lawyers to engage in activity that has traditionally been called the practice of law. That was the legal Zoom case. Uh, that's uh, uh, these preparers of, of documents and so on. There can be all sorts of uh, uh, such things, and that's where the accounting firms, or one of the places uh, they may uh, uh, come in or try to, to come in. 
Second is the licensing of existing lawyers uh, in state A to be able to practice anywhere. Some people call it the driver's license uh, view of, uh, of a law license. Uh, you, you got your driver's license in Virginia, you can drive anywhere, uh, you get your law license in Virginia, you can practice anywhere. What that may do is lead to a kind of national law firms operating with technology, with Skype or something similar, uh, that will uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, allow interstate practice. Third is the firm uh, composed of both lawyers and non-lawyers. This is the one that is most attractive to me because I think we have all sorts of, of uh, problems in the world. Uh, take the divorce uh, situation. Very often it is the problems of sorting out Social Security and, and uh, the, how you take care of the kids and uh, so on that can be handled by uh, uh, people uh, trained in uh, social services uh, who would combine with lawyers and uh, offer combinations of services that you can't now do. Those, I'd suggest, are three different kinds of issues. They'll raise all sorts of different impacts, and uh, we're going to see simultaneous uh, changes in each of those areas as these commissions uh, deal with them in their particular states. Well, that's one last interjection. Are you guys aware of the uniform bar exam that many states, including our beloved Texas, is adopting what's effectively uniform law? The Federalist in me weeps because now state law becomes irrelevant. They'll just know standard law, and that actually makes me very sad. Texas adopted it coming up in two years, so now you don't need to know oil and gas for the bar anymore. That, that's gone. I think there's a the serious loss to the concept of federalism when people say it's just law. The states don't matter. States matter. Well, as a matter of history, it's you know I think about Texas that has come partly from Spanish law, yeah. and I Mississippi and my other states come from English common law, and Louisiana, my other state, uh, the Napoleonic Code. We have this lovely history of the law, the common law of the states developing through different traditions. Um, that's not part of the uniform bar exam. Um, so that's uh, so you may have the last question, sir. Good. So this sort of dovetails with Professor Blackman's um, point right there. So as the UBE becomes less relevant to the law of the individual states, do you think you'll see states, um, do you think it's a non-starter for states to transfer to a certification approach rather than a licensing approach, where you take the bar, become a Virginia certified lawyer, and you get to stamp that on your, on your uh, shingle, but you don't need to be barred to practice law in Virginia? Thank you. Anyone think that there's likely to be a certi certification approach instead of a bar license approach? Is it fair to say we don't know what's coming? I don't know. Yeah, no, I, and I, you know, I, I just want to say one last thing on this question of um, you know, ownership of uh, the involvement of the accounting firms, for example, in owning law firms and things of that sort. The, the kind of problem that I've been discussing, the access issue, greater Minnesota, rural areas, urban areas, um, unrepresented housing court participants, et cetera. Um, that is not an area where I think those developments are likely to have much positive impact. Um, that's an argument among folks on the, on the very profitable end of the practice. Um, so, you know, what, you know, the question you raised about certification, I think lurking behind the question that you ask is going to be some of these experiments that we're seeing unfold, which is how do we get legal resources to communities and to areas that don't have them now? Um, and that probably involves something other than um, a sudden change in the marketplace where there's going to be a flood of lawyers uh, to um, rural counties in Minnesota. And I, I don't know what it's going to look like, and I don't know what the format's going to be, but change is ahead of us, I think. Thank you very much to our panelists.